Now to go to Mr. Lawrence Reed. It's very interesting that we're gathered here, and as Michal said, to have someone like Larry Reed amongst us is, at least for those who've been paying attention to libertarian ideas, classical liberal ones for a long time, he's someone that we do look up to. He's been speaking on behalf of the Foundation for Economic Education for the better part of three decades spreading ideas not just in his home country of the United States, but around the world, everywhere. Like all of you, he is continuing to fight for this, and he has made it his life's work. He became the president of FEE in 2008 after serving as the chairman of the board of trustees in the 90s, and he's been writing for them for a good amount of time. And he served for 20 years as president of the Mackinac Center over there in Michigan. They've done some great work and they continue to do so. He's been teaching economics full-time. He did so at the Northwood University in Michigan, and he was the chairman of the Department of Economics. So we're very happy to have Mr. Lawrence Reed amongst us, and I shall introduce him now. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Yael. Thank you, fellow students. You never cease being a student, so every time I have a chance to talk to students, I usually refer to them as fellow students. Learning is a lifelong endeavor. I have to tell you how utterly thrilled I am to be here for many reasons. First of all, when I see any audience of young people committed to the most noble cause on the earth, that people shall be free. I find that as thrilling as it gets. But also, as I reflect back upon the past, it occurred to me that I'm getting old, that in fact it was 50 years ago, this year, that I first took my step down the libertarian path. I was only 12 years of age but a spark was lit within me that has burned very powerfully ever since. It was in 1968 that I really came alive for liberty because of events right here in this country. When the Soviet, uh, uh, Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia in August of 1968, I remember that moment as if it was yesterday. I still, my, my blood boils when I think of it. I still get goosebumps when I think of the, uh, what we watched on television as Warsaw Pact troops invaded this country in August of 68. I immediately joined an organization then called Young Americans for Freedom. And I heard that they were planning a demonstration against the Soviet invasion in downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, not far from my home. So I bought a bus ticket, and I rode the 30 miles to Pittsburgh and joined in on that demonstration, and we burned a Soviet flag in down, downtown Pittsburgh. And at that point, I began receiving publications from an organization called the Foundation for Economic Education, and never dreamed until recent years I would ever come to lead that group. So I feel a, a, a tremendous gratitude uh, to the brave people not only of this country but throughout Eastern Europe who have advanced liberty immeasurably in the lifetimes of many of us in this room. Tonight I want to talk to you about real heroes and in the course of doing that I hope to answer the question posed on the program, do we need heroes? Does liberty need her heroes? Well, I confess immediately to saying that not only do we need them, we have them. Not only in the past, but I think I, I'm pretty confident in saying that I'm in our midst here tonight are future heroes, men and women who will make a difference in many countries on behalf of these ideals that we share. I think that liberty is the most important thing in the world. I can't imagine life without it. Can you? 
Life in the absence of liberty, to me, is virtually unthinkable. That's how important it is. And liberty is the only social, political, economic arrangement that allows each person to be who he or she is. Under liberty, you're not living somebody else's life or someone else's vision for your life. You're living your life, and it belongs to you and to no one else. Liberty is the only social, political, and economic arrangement that is in accordance with our very human nature. The fact is we're not robots. Each of us is unique and precious. No two people who have ever lived on this planet have been the same. And so when we lose any one person, we've lost something irreplaceable. Well, to be fully human requires that each of us be fully ourselves. To be that unique and precious, precious individual that each of us is. Liberty is also, and I hope this point comes through loud and clear in my talk tonight, liberty is the only system, the only social, political, economic system that requires that we live to high standards of personal character. I've often said that uh, socialism doesn't really require any of us to be people of strong character, and I can guarantee you a people who lose their character will probably end up living under some form of socialism. As I look throughout history, I find that no people in all of history who have lost their character kept their liberties. I think we should make this point time and again as we are arguing to win converts to our way of thinking about personal liberty. We ought to be driving home the point at every opportunity that liberty and character are two sides of the same coin. You cannot have one without the other. Without character, a people will not be free. Without liberty, how will we ever know if you have character? Character and liberty are two sides of the same coin. And that requires me to say something about what I mean by character before I share some stories with you of people who have or had great character. Character to me means Someone who possesses traits of honesty. I can't imagine a free society of dishonest people that degenerates into a free-for-all of people who lie, who break their word, who cheat, and who ultimately steal. No free society can exist if people in great numbers behave that way. Liberty also suggests the character trait of intellectual humility. How many of you have read the great essay by the founder of Fee, Leonard Reed, called I Pencil? Okay. You know, there are many lessons to that story, and it's actually in a book that I believe we've supplied you or you'll get at some point during the conference. One of the messages of that uh, great story is intellectual humility. It's the story of a pencil who explains how no one person in all the world knows how to make him. If you had to start completely from scratch, depending not a, 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 at all upon anyone's talents or skills or knowledge, and you set about to make a pencil, you couldn't do it. You'd have to possess all kinds of traits and knowledge that are not present in any one person. But pencils happen, not because of some mastermind, some central planner that commands that they be made, but rather because of the miracle of the marketplace. And a, People of sound character understand the importance of intellectual humility. As much as we'll ever know, there will always be a universe of knowledge out there that we don't yet know. And if no one person knows how to make a pencil, what does that say about the ability of any person or group of people to plan the lives of millions of others? I think. That's preposterous. It's absurd. We used to think of that as a legitimate political theory, and we argued with it as if it was, was legitimate. But I think too often we fail to laugh it off as utterly 
nonsensical, childish, and preposterous. But other traits are important to liberty as well, traits that I think you find time and again in people who are true heroes. Things like responsibility, things like courage. Why is courage important to liberty? Why is it a necessary character trait in order for liberty to arise and to be sustained? Because all you have to do is look at history very briefly and you quickly realize if you're open-minded that there are plenty of people, and always has been, always will be, who would be happy to take your liberties the moment you give them the opportunity, the moment they think they have the chance. And they're not just in other countries, they are in our midst as well. And therefore, people who believe in liberty must muster the courage to stand up on its behalf, to defend it, to speak out, to take risks, and sometimes even to give their lives if liberty is to survive. I don't see how liberty is possible among a timid people. Well, those are just some. There are many other traits of character that I think are important to liberty, but I think the most important uh, way to teach the principle that liberty and character are two sides of the same coin is to do it through the stories of real people who have been great examples. Heroes. What is a hero? In my mind, a hero is a person who believes in powerfully good ideas, the right ideas, and secondarily has the courage to speak out and defend them, and finally has the character that qualifies them as a spokesperson for those ideas. That's what a hero is to be. They're not just people who are physically brave, but they are also people who are intellectually brave. They are people who are principled, who stand for something and stick by it, who stick by those principles regardless of what the obstacles or the barriers may be, even if abandoning them might advantage them in some way in terms of public attention or political power. People who stand by solid principles of liberty in particular are heroes in my book, especially when they're up against tremendous odds or obstacles, barriers of any kind. And so let me share with you some stories of just such people, and I want to begin with one who was a student at the time he proved himself a hero. This man's name was Thomas Clarkson. How many have heard of Thomas Clarkson? Okay, I hope you don't mind hearing this story, perhaps again in a few cases. Thomas Clarkson in the 1780s was a young man at Cambridge University studying to be an Anglican minister. The 1780s was a time when slavery was a widely accepted institution. His country, Great Britain, was the greatest slave trading power of the time. It was widely accepted and scholars and teachers and intellectuals and even preachers often either looked upon it with great indifference or they actually sanctified it, justified it with such comments as, well, some people are born to live at the end of a whip. Some people are simply meant to be slaves to others. That was not uncommon at that time. And there were many people in Britain who directly or indirectly were making considerable amounts of money off of the very lucrative slave trade. Thomas Clarkson, when he entered Cambridge University, did not know anything about slavery. But there was an incident on the high seas that would change his life. It involved a slave ship by the name of the Zong, the Zong. Like other slave vessels leaving ports in Britain of, say, Bristol, Portsmouth, it sailed along the west coast of Africa, making many stops, apprehending people and enslaving them, and ultimately intending to send them to short lives of arduous labor in plantations in the Caribbean. But the Zong 
had an especially long voyage. It had to make many stops, many difficulties in rounding up the more than 400 people it would enslave to carry to the West Indies. And that meant that those who were on the vessel the longest were in the most uh, terrible health near the end of the voyage. They were emaciated. They were uh, sick, near death in many cases. And as the ship approached Jamaica, the captain of the ship observed his, as he would call it, cargo and realized that quite a few of these people were in terrible shape. And he thought to himself, if I proceed to auction, many of these people are in such terrible shape, I will not be able to sell them for very much. And so he made a cold and cruel calculation. He decided that if he could get rid of those in the most terrible condition, about 120, that he could put in for an insurance claim and make more money that way than if he went on to sell them at auction in the Caribbean. So he gave the order to throw overboard 122 living souls. This was not uncommon at the time of slavery. But on this occasion, there were crew members of the Zong who had a conscience. And when the vessel returned to Britain, some of those crew members began to talk. They began to confess. It led to an attorney by the name of Granville Sharp deciding to file murder charges against the captain of the Zong. And there was a famous trial. But in the end of that trial, the judge dismissed the case. And he said in his dismissal, this is not a criminal case. This is a civil dispute. This is simply a civil dispute between a slave ship captain and an insurance company. And throwing those people overboard was like nothing more than throwing horses overboard. And the case was dismissed. At that, that time, there was a professor at Cambridge who was in charge every year of deciding what the essay topic was that students could enter. There was a, uh, a very coveted prize. Students at Cambridge could enter the essay contest, but only if they wrote their essays in Latin. And this professor decided, we're going to work off the case of the Zong and this year, the topic will be resolved that no man has a right to own another. Young Thomas Clarkson decides to enter the essay contest. He doesn't know anything about slavery. But he's a very diligent student who does his own research. He goes to the ports of Bristol and, uh, uh, and Portsmouth looking for crew members of slave ships who would talk to him. And he finds some. And he ends up writing an essay that won first prize, an essay in which he argued vigorously that the institution of slavery is brutal, it's inhumane, it's a blot on the conscience of the British nation and must be abolished. He's only in his 20s. This is an institution widely accepted. He wins first prize and on his way from Cambridge to his village of Wisbeck, he's on horseback and he's thinking about what he learned in his research and what he wrote in his prize winning essay and later he writes in his diary what happened during this journey between Cambridge and Wisbeck. He wrote how there was a spot when he had to stop. He had to get off of his horse. He fell to his knees. And he wrote, it was at that point that I said to myself, 
If what I have written is true, someone must see these calamities to an end. Someone must see these calamities to an end. He wouldn't have known it, of course, but he would spend the next 61 years, the rest of his life, setting aside his planned occupation to be a minister, to devote every waking moment to liberate enslaved peoples. He looks around trying to find allies. Who will join my cause? Doesn't see very many people who have ever said anything about it and a lot of people who have supported it. He notices that there are these odd people called Quakers that uh, were among the few who had spoken out against slavery. So he approaches Quakers, and it was in May of 1787 that he organizes around a table of a print shop in London, the world's first think tank. It was called the Society for the Abolition of the Slave Trade. Twelve people, Clarkson being one of them, most of the others being Quakers, decide we're going to create an organization and we're going to change the conscience of this nation. That was a tall undertaking in 1787. An unthinkable, impossible undertaking. But for the next 20 years, These people will work tirelessly for what they know to be right. Their story is a story of perseverance. Their story is a story of when good people know what's right, they should not and do not give up. Over the next 20 years, Clarkson himself will travel on horseback 35,000 miles around Britain. He's gathering signatures on petitions against the slave trade. He's giving speeches, he's giving sermons, he's convincing people. They translated his essay from Latin into English and have published it and are distributing it along with many other tracts and pamphlets over the years. Clarkson will endure death threats during this 20 year period. On one occasion, he's nearly beaten to death on the docks of Bristol, England. In the first few years of this fight, they actually, the anti-slavery forces actually score uh, some important victories in parliament, not in votes, but in winning over key members of parliament. Their numbers every year go up. Clarkson is one of the people who uh, uh, personally recruited William Wilberforce to be the anti-slavery movement's man in parliament. Every year, For 18 years, William Wilberforce introduced a bill to abolish the trade in slaves. And for 17 of those years, it would go down to defeat, often by big margins. But in the first few years, their numbers go up. But then along comes war with France in 1793, and all of a sudden, you have members of parliament pointing to the anti-slavery people saying, you are traitors. You want to abolish the British slave trade. All that would do is to hand this very profitable business over to the French. You're traitors. And now their numbers dwindle. This would have been a time for them to say, we're never going to win this. Maybe we should do something else. But that never occurred to them. These were men and women of character, Thomas Clarkson and William Wilberforce being among among them. They only redoubled their efforts for what they knew to be right. They organized meetings all across Britain. They got key figures like Josiah Wedgwood, the great pottery entrepreneur, on their side. He designed the image that became the logo of the anti-slavery movement. It was an image of a kneeling black man with his hands in prayer. He's looking skyward. He's in chains. And around the perimeter of this logo, wherever it appeared, were the words, Am I not a man and a brother? That was a powerful tool. It was actually a, a, a vision. It was a, it was a visual that people could look at and say, we are enslaving these people. This is not right. F- 
Finally, it was in 1807, February, at 4 a.m., after 20 years of this nonstop effort, when Parliament voted to abolish the trade in slaves. It was one of the greatest moments in the liberation of people in all time, February 1807. At that point, you wouldn't have blamed Clarkson or Wilberforce if, they, if either one had said, well, we've been fighting this for 20 years. In Clarkson's case, he gave up his plans to be a minister for this cause. He wasn't making any money off of it. He was setting, behind, setting, setting back his own plans for his life. You would think at that point they would say, victory is ours. The next battle is to liberate the enslaved, but we'll let somebody else do that. But they didn't. They knew that what they had won was only a partial victory. They ended the trade in slaves, but they didn't liberate the people who were enslaved. And so now they devote themselves to the next and final objective, which is to end slavery itself, not simply the trade in slaves. And guess how many more years this will take? 26 more years. So for Thomas Clarkson, this, is, this proves to be a 46-year project. It wasn't until 1833 when the British Parliament voted to liberate all those people within its jurisdiction who had been enslaved. In a great book written about a decade or so ago, Adam Huxchild talks about uh, what happened on the day when those people were freed across those Caribbean islands where they had been laboring in slavery for so long. Many of those people went to the highest point on the island that they were on the night before the law was to take effect because they wanted to be there when the sun came up the next morning because to them that was the beginning of a new day in more ways than one. Thomas Clarkson now is in his 70s, and he lives another 13 years. And guess what he does with his life, the remaining 13 years? He devotes his every waking moment to helping improve the lot of those who had been enslaved. When he finally died at the age of 86 in 1846, London saw one of the biggest funerals it had seen in decades. This was a young man at one time who was ridiculed, who was attacked, who was, who was threatened, who was beaten to near, uh, 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 within an inch of his life. And now in 1846, he's widely celebrated throughout Britain as one of its greatest heroes for humanity. Huxchild, in that book, also talks about an interesting development at Clarkson's funeral. I mentioned that his allies from the early days were Quakers. Quaker men had a habit of not taking off their hats in the presence of nobility if they could get away with it, because to them that offended a higher authority. But in 1846, the sons and the grandsons of the Quakers who had joined with Clarkson so many years before, did something at his funeral that Quaker men almost never did. They took off their hats. For them, this was a hero for liberty. We owe so much to people like Thomas Clarkson, who understand the value of liberty and will not give up in their effort to see that people enjoy what is rightfully theirs. Let me share with you a couple other stories. How many of you have heard of Harriet Tubman? Harriet Tubman, you, you may see her on a $10 American Federal Reserve note in a few years, and because I'm not a friend of the Federal Reserve, I'm not sure that's a very great honor. But nonetheless, she would certainly be deserving of, of any recognition she can get. Harriet Tubman was born a slave in 1820 in the state of Maryland. She had a slave master who was occasionally quite cruel. There was one moment, in fact, when he, with a metal object, beat her on the head. And she, for decades thereafter, had uh, migraine headaches and uh, blurry vision. 
She suffered from that from, until her 70s. But in 1829, at the age of 29, Harriet Tubman decided liberty is too important. I'm taking all the risk that it requires to be free. I'm leaving. And she fled slavery and made her way into uh, a northern state where she was free. And if that's all she had ever done, you'd say, well, she was a hero. She certainly deserved to be free. Good for her. But Harriet Tubman didn't stop there because to her, her freedom was only the beginning. She saw the importance of the freedom for others. And so she became the most famous conductor of what in America we call the Underground Railroad. This was not a railroad of, of tracks, of railroad tracks, but of trails and river crossings, very dangerous journey. She became the best known conductor. That meant she would venture back into slave states. She did so 13 times at great risk. She could have been killed at any moment. Great risk to herself, she would venture back into these slave states, round up slaves, and secretly take them to safety and to freedom in northern states. She did that and in the process saved and freed almost 100 human beings. 70, 78 I think was the number. After slavery was abolished in the United States, Harriet Tubman devoted the rest of her life, many decades in fact, to charitable work, largely helping those who had endured slavery. But there's something about her you may not have heard. Uh, in the 1890s, because she's in her 70s at this point, she decides to have brain surgery for that problem that she had stemming from the beating uh, many years before. Brain surgery in the 1890s. But the most remarkable thing is she refused anesthesia. She said, just give me a bullet and I'll bite down on the bullet. And that's what happened. The surgeons uh, 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 sawed into her skull and whatever it was they did, she did not have a recurrence of the migraines and she lived another 13 or 15 years uh, and spoke about this operation many times in terms like this. She said, yes, they opened up the top of my head, did something in there and now I feel just fine with no anesthesia. I mean, this is a hero from start to finish. I mean, why would you deny yourself uh, anesthesia? But she was one tough bird. Uh, she had endured so much, she probably thought that brain surgery was no big deal. <laughs> Another person I want to tell you about is a man from Poland named Witold Pilecki. How many know who? Okay, how many of you are from Poland? Ah, okay, well, everybody, <laughs> you know about Pilecki. I'm very happy to say that only two evenings ago, I spent an hour with Mr. Pilecki's son, who is now 85 years of age. Vito Pilecki has got to be one of the bravest men in the history of the world. I'm happy to tell you there are uh, movies at least two that I've learned of uh, in the works right now. One hopefully will come out about a year from now about this man. Witold Pilecki was born in 1901 when there was no Poland. There was no Poland for about 123 years from partition in the 1790s uh, until Poland reemerged as a nation in 1918. Witold Pilecki as a young man fought during the First World War. When it ended in 1918, you might think, well, now, now he can go back to being a free person. But Lenin's Russia decided not to let Poland alone. And as you Poles know, for three years, there was continued war as Lenin and uh, Bolshevik Russia tried to retain its hold on Poland. But Pol and Vito Pilecki continued to fight for those three years, was decorated for his bravery during this time. Finally, in 1921, Poland emerges with its independence uh, intact and the Russians are gone. And so for a brief time, Pilecki uh, enjoys freedom. He raises a family, has two children. 
But in 1939, of course, the Nazis invade Poland from the west, and two weeks later, the Russians from the east. What does Pilecki do? Now, about age 40, he immediately joins the resistance, becomes a leading commander, uh, an organizer of resistance elements against both the Russians and the Nazis. He fights them bravely for a year. And then in 1940, he comes up with a plan. If you don't know this story, you will be blown away by this. The Poles began to get word of some things happening at this place called Auschwitz, but they don't have much documentation yet. They need to know what's going on in this place that so many people seem to be sent to in southern Poland, the Auschwitz concentration camp. Witold Pilecki says to his comrades, I will volunteer to go to Auschwitz. Now his plan is nothing more than to get arrested by the Germans in the hope that they will send him to Auschwitz. I mean, they could have killed him on the spot or sent him someplace else. But he would probably tell you today that he was lucky that the plan went according to his wishes and he was sent to Auschwitz, as strange as that may seem. And within the first month of being incarcerated at Auschwitz, he forms a resistance. He, he convinces others uh, that he can trust to join the resistance. They begin smuggling documents out of the country to let the world know what's going on. His documents, his reports become known collectively as Vitold's report. It, they were the first comprehensive inside reports of what was happening in Auschwitz and with the beginning of the Holocaust. The world was learning for the first time of what was happening in places like that because of Witold Pilecki. He will do this for two and a half years as an inmate in Auschwitz, enduring beatings and terrible conditions, ill health much of the time. The Nazis become aware that information is getting out. They know somebody's doing something they shouldn't. And so they start to try to find who's involved in this resistance movement. They detect some and execute them. And they get very close to Pilecki when he engineers something that only 143 people in the history of Auschwitz ever successfully did, and that was to escape. He escapes from Auschwitz, one of only 143 people to do that, after two and a half years incarceration. Does he then retire uh, to the countryside and, and to a peaceful life? No. He makes his way to Warsaw, 200 miles away, and becomes a leading commander in the Warsaw Uprising against the Nazis. The Soviets, of course, will sit outside the city as the massacre takes place. The Nazis crush the Warsaw Uprising. Pilecki is arrested and sent to a German prisoner of war camp where he spends the last year of the war. Fortunately, the Germans never put two and two together and realized this was the guy who formed the resistance within Auschwitz. Finally, when he's freed, when the camp is liberated uh, at the close of World War II in May of 1945, you might think, well, finally, he's going to enjoy freedom. And for a very brief period, he does, about four months. And the Polish army sends him to Italy. But then it becomes apparent, as 1945 wears on, that the Soviets are not going to leave Poland. And so the Polish army says, we need to send somebody back inside Poland, undercover, to report on what the Soviets are doing. And of course, they realize nobody does it better than Witold Pilecki. So that he gets sent back into Poland, and for two years he's a spy undercover against the Soviets, reporting to the world what the Soviets are doing in occupied Poland, until his cover is blown in 1947. He's arrested, tortured, put on a public show trial, and finally, at the age of 47, in 1948, with two children, ages 17 and 16, who are still alive, he was executed. Now, there's a man who cannot help but be regarded as a hero. What courage! Liberty meant everything to him. 
absolutely everything to him. And the world came to know of the Holocaust in part because of his bravery in that period. I think we should remember people like Vitold Pilecki because for liberty they gave everything. Finally, I want to tell you, how, how are we on time? Okay, getting close, okay, getting close. Let me work towards a conclusion and, and give you just uh, one other story. Uh, in 1986, I spent a couple of weeks in Poland with people who were active in the underground. And this is why Poland, to me, is one of the most important countries of the world in terms of the effect that it had on my life. The Czech Republic is very close behind because of those developments I mentioned in 1968. But uh, in 1986, because I wanted to see firsthand what were people doing under communism? How were they, those who were resisting, how were they doing it? What kept their spirits together? And so for two weeks, spending a, every night at a different home, I learned firsthand how brave those people were. I remember meeting with a group of people your age, young printers, illegal, printing illegal literature in communist Poland. They brought out stacks of this stuff, uh, great works from the West, books uh, by uh, Mises and Hayek, translated and illegally published and distributed in Poland uh, by the underground. And I asked these young people at one point, where do you guys get all the paper to print this stuff? And a young man named Pavel answered, and he said, we get it from two places. One, we steal it, or I'm sorry, he said, we smuggle it in from the West, and two, we steal it from communists. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, the government has its own factories where they make their publications, but the workers on the inside increasingly are on our side, and they smuggle the government's paper out to us and sometimes even print our material on the government's own printing presses. <laughs> what bravery. But the most uh, incredible story I want to uh, t tell you uh, comes from one evening with a couple named Romashevsky, Zbigniew and Sofia. They had run the underground radio for solidarity during the first six months of martial law from December of 81 to the middle of 82, running an underground illegal radio station broadcasting a message of liberty uh, for Poland. They had been arrested, ultimately. He was given four years in prison, she was given three. And when I visited with them in November of 86, they, neither one had been out of prison for very long. And I asked them, when you were broadcasting, uh, that radio station, how did you know if people were listening? And Sophia answered this way, we didn't know how many people were listening. We could only broadcast eight or ten minutes at a time, and then we had to go off the air. But she said one night while people uh, were listening, we asked them, if you believe in liberty for Poland, blink your lights. Call your friends who think the same way and ask them to blink their lights. And then she told me, we went to the window and for hours, all of Warsaw was blinking. Well, I think of each and every one of you as advocates for liberty, as a blinking light. And I hope you'll never let your light go out. I hope you will never allow even a hint of pessimism affect your mission. I'd like to tell audiences that if you're a pessimist, if you believe in liberty and you're also pessimistic, well then you're part of the problem, you're not part of the solution. If you're pessimistic, if you think all is lost, that as noble as a cause this, as this is, we're gonna lose, then I'd say, you need to find something else to do. <laughs> you need to be optimistic, and for a couple of reasons. First of all, what's the point of pessimism? None of us know the future. 
There are many examples throughout history of people who fought against the longest of odds and the greatest of obstacles on behalf of what they knew to be right, and they ultimately prevailed. The Romashevskys, when they were broadcasting that uh, illegal radio, they had no idea that Poland would be free uh, in their lifetimes. But it didn't matter to them because liberty was that important. It's the birthright of every individual. It's something you fight for. You don't lie back and let somebody else take it from you. So perseverance is important in, face of, in the face of whatever the odds or the obstacles may be. If you're pessimistic, you're not going to work very hard for what you know to be right. And you're not going to be very effective at convincing others to join your cause. If you tell people, join my cause, uh, be an advocate for liberty, but oh, by the way, we're going to lose, <laughs> they're going to say, well, why bother? Why should, why, who wants to join a losing cause? So we have to be optimists. I can tell you one thing, if we're all pessimists, liberty cannot succeed. But armed with optimism and with character, we can make the world a better and freer place. And along the way, we must not forget those heroes in our midst and from our past who serve as the examples we must emulate. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.